It's that time again. Fervent anticipation for this new series has been higher than ever before. Maybe it's because once again they left it to the last minute to actually confirm anything, but this is fine with me. I honestly love being kept in the dark, avoiding trailers, rumours and the rest. That is until Harbo Wombs bangs on my door at 3am shouting and screaming about the latest news. After watching this first episode of series 13, I could only think of one thing. Same it different year. I mean, don't get me wrong, they seem to have lit several matches at once with two returning villains and a whole bunch of other weird new shit. I much prefer the idea of a series that balances recurring and new villains as opposed to one or the other. Overall though, I just felt like it was one massive teaser for the series as a whole instead of having anything substantial happen to anybody bar the ending. Oh, and uh our new companion getting forced into becoming a companion. Nice to meet you, Rose. Run for your life. The dialogue is just as infuriating as ever. There was too much and too little happening simultaneously. Pretty run of the mill for this iteration of the show. There's actually a lot more to unpack than I initially thought, and due to this series being chronological from start to finish, there will be more speculation than I am generally comfortable with putting into a review. I'll get into the core of my thoughts surrounding this episode in a moment, but first a word from this video's sponsor. Atlas VPN is a pro program and app that allows you to browse the net as though you were doing so in another country. This means you can bypass restrictions on certain websites laid out by governments and private companies. If you want access to YouTube in China, a VPN will sort you out. If you just happen to be abroad whilst this new Doctor Who episode airs, you can watch it on iPlayer with the trusty help of a VPN. I know that you know most of this already, but I bet you didn't know that Atlas VPN are currently running a three-year membership deal with three extra months thrown in for free. Grabbing this deal means you would be paying the equivalent of £1.04 a month and they have a 30-day money-back guarantee as well. Click my link down in the video description for this limited time Black Friday offer of 86% off and three months free. Thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the review. Oh, and uh, spoilers obviously. The episode excellently illustrates within seconds the oldest and greatest issue the show suffers from. Where would you like to go next star who fucking cares? Anywhere in the universe. Within budget. Budget. I am not kidding. I initially thought the pair were just on a green screen and that they'd genuinely forgotten to put a backdrop in here. The scene is as exposition ridden as you'd come to expect of this era, ridding it of any tension you might expect from the two main characters hanging upside down above a pit of acid. I want to blame Budget again for the fact we didn't see their failed attempt at sneaking on board this guy's base, but simultaneously with all the waffle we're subjected to in this scene, a dependence on dialogue probably probably can't come from anywhere else aside from the writer. The idea that the audience were deprived of not only a whole segment of this adventure, but several adventures without Graham and Ryan. Since Ryan and Graham left, have I not taken you to amazing places? Of course. Was a really poor excuse for these two being essentially friends. What does it matter? Because I thought we were friends. We are friends. Oh, we're friends. Sure, you can blame COVID for this gap of friendship development, but thinking back to the two whole series she's been a companion, it never really felt like either character did anything to make this friendship justified. It always tried to force it and not develop it, hence the opportunity to do so is long gone. I can only think of one episode that might give their relationship some weight out of 22. It's no wonder they're constantly quarrelling and bickering. Not only does the pair's shared dialogue condemn them into being un unbelievable friends, but genuinely gets them out of falling to their deaths. Trapezium 7, that high gravity circus workshop, go with the top two in the class. <laughs> Because of an adventure the pair had that the audience can't relate to, this escape sequence truly had me gawking with my nose. 
this is what it looks like. Oddly, I found the handcuff voice activated release mechanism gag to be rather funny. This may be the only obstacle the pair faced with some difficulty before the end of the episode, and I genuinely appreciated the nod to modern voice recognition devices being suitably unreliable. The peak of the comedy, though, was the fact that TARDIS just happened to be sitting face up on this random rock here. What a coincidence! What Chibnall was trying to say by having a double bed just sitting around in the TARDIS console room and two sets of handcuffs in the Doctor's pocket remains to be seen. Another aspect of this episode that remains to be seen is the first interlude. A bunch of people are doing some digging and some wealthy businessmen have a squabble about who has the bigger brain. Given that there is a connection of location between this place and present day Liverpool, perhaps some wibbly wobbly timey wimey events in this initial timeline will have a cause and effect ripple on the modern day. How this potential matches up with the impending apocalypse in the present day though, leaves me a little apprehensive about the prospect. Also, did anybody else feel that this transition into the window was painfully stuttery? We're then introduced to Dan, the series' new companion. He's got this desperate underdog vibe to him that I thought was reminiscent of Yaz in her introductory episode. He's escorted out of the Museum of Liverpool for not being an official tour guide by a character called Diane. This character definitely felt odd to me considering one moment she's giving Dan a spanking and the next... So, are we still on for Halloween drinks tonight? Alright, maybe there's a reason for this sudden change in attitude that's to be revealed. She also claims that Dan's got a trade that he should be focusing on instead, which I don't actually think was established in this episode. If it was a job duller than a broken sandwich, it might be somewhat compelling for a potential companion, had they not already used this excuse twice before. Maybe if they made it more contemporary, like... He lost his job because of Covid, and he resorted to escapism, that might make for a refreshing twist on the companion dynamic. We are then thrown into a psychic vision of the Doctor watching a crystal guy named Swarm get free after being chained up since the dawn of the universe? Maybe having a first person perspective from Swarm might have made this psychic link a bit more believable. When the trick or treat gag happened at the end of this guy's scene, I genuinely forgot that the Doctor was forced to witness all this in her mind. Apparently Yaz was just twiddling her thumbs the whole time and then realised that the TARDIS had a leak. Nothing to worry about, it's fine. I'm fine, TARDIS is fine, we're all fine. Once again Yaz displays cardboard characteristics here, unable to identify that the the doctor is absolutely lying through her teeth. Instead, she says, Halloween, trick or treat. As though the doctor's strange behaviour and the leak had just been erased from her memory. This is also reinforced later when the doctor gives herself a brain analysis. Quick MOT check on my mind, had a little glitch. You didn't mention it. You know what, Yaz? I don't mention everything. Well, exactly. The doctor was subjected to a four minute long vision and Yaz didn't even notice. The dialogue in this sequence was just downright atrocious too. The teacher and student dynamic here has the former delivering exposition that even Chibnall acknowledges is just ridiculous. Do not engage with the prisoner in conversation. Do not do anything that it asks. I mean, obviously, I have done my site resistance training. Despite this command, mere moments afterwards, she breaks her own rules and becomes personally affected by this prisoner's prophetic words. So much for Our job is to ensure all incarceration systems are still functional and get the hell out. This whole vision felt like a massive joke to me. We have a prisoner who could have escaped the whole time, a veteran guard getting killed, and of course, telling and not showing. Containment chamber active. Containment chamber malfunction. Your last tour in Syntax. Now you're handing over your task to a child. Damn! I was two days from retirement. Back in Liverpool, Dan is seen handing out drugs to the staff at the local food bank as well as the children out trick-or-treating. Handing out drugs for free clearly isn't working out for him financially though, so a big guy with a shaggy dog face comes along to take him away. The warrior tries a Jedi mind trick on Dan that ends in failure and so instead zaps him into a cage and takes him to safety. Considering we learn later that the race of northern Chewbacca's are actually here to save humanity, his line about executing them comes off as a little odd. The Doctor then appears on Dan's street with a rather phony backdrop of Anfield Stadium being shown behind them. The pair make their way into Dan's house and the Doctor suddenly has an illustration of an army of ships headed for Earth. There! 
7.2 minutes ago, Calvinist's ship leaving Earth, shielded against detection. Looks like you detected him without issue though. The pair figure out just at the right moment that this laptop isn't Dan's. The house is then shrunk to the size of a grabbable object, which immediately reminded me of how the Master had shrunk people in the previous series. Presumably, Carvanista put the laptop there knowing that the Doctor would go for the first bit of tech she saw to try and track him down. It certainly shows foresight on the part of this character, except for the fact that it only decided to activate after the pair left the house. He's deliberately leaving traps in case he's followed. Yes, thank you, Captain Obvious. The pair then bumped into a character named Claire who had foreknowledge of the Doctor. I was quite surprised that despite this rather notable recognition, the Doctor took so little interest in her and preferred chasing Carvanista's heels. Despite this, it was still quite a fascinating moment to me because I have always been in love with the idea of people meeting the Doctor in the wrong order. I just haven't met you yet. Even the shot of her standing in front of the TARDIS making herself walk home clearly troubled by something was quite effective in displaying a character forced to face fixed events in time. She continued walking home and found a weeping angel. I appreciated that she had the foreknowledge of how to handle this thing. Fat lot of good it did her though. I understand its instinct to turn your head to see what you're doing, but the fact this character does it not once but three times made the scenario a bit of a laughing stock. I'm assuming that more about this character and the angel will be developed across the series, but this introduction had me feeling like they put the angels in here purely for the fact it's a Halloween special and nothing else. <laughs> Did somebody step on a plate here? What the fuck's with that sound effect? Hot on the trail once again, the pair forcefully spouted what they were doing to find Carvanista's ship. Sending Carvanista's craft ID. Cross-referencing with spatial temporal locations. I'll restrict to this solar system and time zone for exact trajectory. Oh, aren't you just so cute? Dan is then seen aboard Carvanista's ship. Once again, Chibnall doesn't seem to expect the audience to understand the situation that's put in front of us. The dog shot me. The bars on that holding pen are electrified. Space. However, I was quite interested by this fluffy character begrudgingly saving the human race from its imminent demise. It establishes his species as being authoritative enough to respect, whereas the task is something he despises as though he was made to do bigger and better things. It makes his rather hot-tempered attitude seem believable and incentivizes me to watch out for his actions throughout the series. The Doctor and Yaz arrive to save the day, and the Doctor uses leftover hopper virus particles to screw up the ship's security security systems, just like they did in Orphan 55. She pulls the packet out of her pockets, making me wonder if they're bigger on the inside too. She confronts Carvanista without obstacle thanks to the sonic screwdriver. It made me wonder how she could have possibly messed up so badly to get her in that sticky situation we saw at the beginning of the episode. Yaz got Dan out of his cell in equally convenient fashion, and we discover that the Lupars, Carvanista's species, are out to rescue humanity from the apocalypse. I wasn't too fussed about this reveal, given that the whole 7 billion ships humanoid dog thing had previously been established, making this oddly satisfying. Throughout this conversation, it's revealed that this guy is, or was, a member of the Division, that weird Gallifreyan secret service that was alluded to in The Timeless Children. It seems like the objective of the season is to have the Doctor find out what they are up to. We'll just have to pray that this exploration resolves some of the questions that the previous finale left me craving answers for. Meanwhile, in a very non-specific region of the Arctic Circle, some British people smash a UFO thing in their garage. They both appear expectant that this thing would turn up at some point, and later on the bloke got disintegrated and the woman was revealed to be this crystal guy's sister? I honestly haven't the fucking foggiest what's going on with these lot. The Sontarans also got a little teasy return that honestly I felt was quite out of place in this first episode. Maybe I'm saying that knowing they're supposedly taking centre stage in the next one. However, they didn't look bad and I did laugh at them calling each other disgusting and the prospect of them taking advantage of this universal destruction had me pretty hard for the next episode. It was also great that they brought back Dan Starkey as this hologram Sontaran who has the privilege of delivering one of my favourite lines in the show's history. This is a quart! This is sport! Bring it on, I say.
Out there in the vast wilderness of space, Grey Worm from Game of Thrones was seen living the dream, watching the universe go by. He's apparently observed over 21,000 rotations, whatever that means, with everything remaining the same. I loved the sarcastically optimistic commentary he gave to his superiors, though. It made me wonder if he is being punished in some way, perhaps a prisoner more than a worker. It gives the absurdity of this situation a bit of acknowledgement before we get to see the flux for the first time, disintegrating planets like they were nothing. I do really like the look of it, and it's strange saying that given the episode's rather appalling visuals displayed thus far. It will be interesting to find out whether this thing was created or is merely a product of nature, perhaps drawing parallels with the pandemic's origins and how it spread like wildfire. The trio escaped Carvinista's ships thanks to more convenient laser inaccuracy, and the TARDIS brought them near Pluto or something. They witnessed the flux firsthand, and the Doctor got a hilarious vision of this random planet getting completely annihilated. This led to the Doctor having an Obi-Wan Kenobi reaction to it all. I can feel it all. I can feel the universe breaking. I felt a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. And then she has another teasy vision with Mr. Crystalline, implying that he had fought her before, but she can't remember it. The Doctor then brought the flux directly to Earth, where the band of dogs instantly formed a protective shell around it. Now, bearing in mind that Carvanista, up until this point, A, doesn't like the Doctor. He laid traps for Earth's number one protector knowing she would have a problem with his species' actions. B, has limited knowledge of the flux itself. What's the flux? A cataclysm of unknown proportions or patterns we, we don't know for sure. And C, isn't command of this battalion to my knowledge. Otherwise, why would he resent the fact he has to save human beings? And yet suddenly, at the push of a button on his ship, all seven billion of them are cooperating in creating a considerably sized sphere to shield the Earth from the flux. I do like the sentiment of at least die trying, but those ships must be Fucking massive. At least 10 football pitches per ship, if I've done my maths right. And by the way, this calculation assumes that the ships are locked together in this way on the surface of the Earth, which they aren't. So these ships are going to be even bigger than 10 football pitches. Do they really need all that space? for one human and a dog? Whatever. We'll just have to hope and pray the Doctor blasting Vortex energy to burn a hole into the Flux does enough to protect herself, her friends, the TARDIS, and the Earth in the following episode. So, did it suck? I mean, there's plenty to chew on. I like that at least. It's the Doctor Who Variety Hour! I was kind of reminded of the German Netflix series Dark, which I've previously recommended to you guys. The variety of different timelines that directly affect one another make it really enjoyable. The only thing is, those timelines were explored and established over the course of three whole seasons. The first episode of Doctor Who Flux has thrown so many bits and pieces at us that it makes some of them downright forgettable. Perhaps there will be focus on one or two next week and then another two the week after. Subscribers of the channel will know I normally give out a rating at the end of my reviews, but this time I'll be reserving such gradings until part six is out. I think it a bit unfair and hasty to judge moments like the crystalline sister kidnapping Diane off the dodgiest looking street corner in Liverpool, and the fact the TARDIS seemingly grows new doors from the inside. Yet at the same time, I can't help but feel this episode was like one massive trailer for the series, rather than packing some serious punches left, right and centre. It's not helped by the two prior series being so divisive and frustrating to watch, and this first episode appears to be a continuation of that trend instead of maybe doing a soft reset like they did with series 10. I am somewhat eager to see how all these threads tie together, and I am kinda praying that they actually do so. Don't forget you can sign up to my Patreon page for early access to reviews like this one, as well as a whole bunch of bonus content you won't find on YouTube. Thanks for watching, see you all next week.
I mean, don't get me wrong, they seem to have lit several matches at once. Once? How this potential matches up with the impending acopolypse. Can't say acopolypse. Packing some serious punches left, right, and center. That is my ringtone. <laughs>